beta 3, SMD, T, and we can also add, of course, as a final control variable, uh, the value factor, HML, T. And again, because it's a regression equation, we have to add a residual term here, epsilon T. Yeah? So we can add different uh, control variables and then check again if our intercept term uh, is positive. Yeah? If this is positive, obviously, we have excess returns that's, that survive controlling for different sources of risk on the right hand side. So why do we not use the Wahlman Friends 5 factor model or 6 factor model here? So obviously uh, because data for the investment factor or profitability factor are not available uh, for the uh, 20, uh, for 1920, 1930, 1940 periods and uh, that's why we um, basically focus on the Wahlman Friends 3 factor model here for control purposes. So we do a whole bunch of uh, additional analysis, obviously, as well, when we go through, through the paper. Uh, not all of the analysis I want to discuss here in, in this course here. I just want to pick some, some, some in increments that I think could be of, of interest for your own research as well. And uh, of course, what we also do is we, um, we were talking about cross-sectional regressions earlier in, in this course. Um, uh, you can also, uh, instead of using these cross-sectional regressions, you can uh, implement uh, so-called uh, stochastic discount factor models using generalized methods of moments technique, uh, which is a little bit more complicated, obviously, and this is something that is easy to implement uh, in programs such as MATLAB, but this is obviously not the main purpose of uh, this course here, so we uh, skip this analysis. What we do instead, what, what I would like to uh, discuss with you instead, is um, uh, a risk factor analysis. So the, the question arises, uh, is there any economic or statistical evidence that this risk factor here actually, uh, or, or that the strategy here, this uh, short-term industrial momentum strategy, or the risk managed counterpart, is there any evidence or in, uh, any economic evidence that this uh, could be a risk factor. Yeah? So obviously it's not enough to say okay um, this, uh, we, we have a, this, this risk factor generates uh, an alpha or an intercept term uh, that is significant. Yeah? So uh, there are obviously some conditions that need, to be, that need to be fulfilled so that we can actually say that this guy here is uh, a risk factor. So, so one thing what we have been doing in this paper is we have employed principal component analysis. Uh, we have not reported uh, it, it in, this, in, in, in this paper, but what uh, is it, what is actually doing is that you um, decrease the dimension here. Yeah? So you basically you, you investigate can we uh, we you divide this forty eight uh, test assets the space of forty eight test assets into a lower dimension. Yeah? So if, if you have if you do principal component analysis and it turns out that you have let's say four uh, dominant eigenvalues, yeah, then you would basically you, you can it means you can explain the, the the majority of the variance of this 48 test assets by uh, four uh, stochastic uh, processes that uh, are uncorrelated. Yeah? And each of these uh, 48 uh, input assets would be then a linear combination uh, of these. Uh, for different orthogonal stochastic processes. Now, this is also something that I um, have discussed earlier in research in financial markets, yeah, but I would like to skip it uh, this year. Instead, what I would like to discuss with you is uh, a GARG and mean model. Let's take this away. So, there is, you can theoretically uh, derive, based upon the uh, law of one price, that a risk factor needs to satisfy uh, a couple of conditions. So the first condition is that the sample average uh, should be positive. Yeah? So we, have, we should have a positive, positive average return of that risk factor. And this uh, stochastic process, so the, the time series evolution 
of a risk factor looks, looks something like that. Yeah? So it's a stochastic process and the, the sample average of that stochastic process, yeah, the sample average, but it's maybe something like here, should be positive. So this is the sample average, the average return or the average excess return, but since it's a zero-cost portfolio, it's obviously by default excess, it's in, the, in excess form because the risk-free rate on both sides cancels out, right? So the average return should be positive, and moreover, the average return, so these, or yeah, the average return uh, conditional on time t should be fully explained by its conditional variance. This is something that you can uh, theoretically derive, and this is theoretically derived in my paper from 2016 in the Journal of Financial, uh, in the uh, Journal of Finance Research Letters. The paper is entitled "Identifying Portfolio-Based Systematic Risk Factors in Equity Markets," and uh, the idea of that derivation comes actually from another paper, uh, which is also of course cited, it's uh, from Chuck and Road and Conrad, 2008 working paper entitled Identifying Risk-Based Factors. Yeah? So yeah, there you can basically find the theoretical derivation uh, of all these things. Yeah? So again, uh, the sample average should be positive and the uh, sample mean should be a function of the conditional volatility. Yeah? And it should be fully explained, actually, by its conditional volatility. So how can you test that theory? So what we, what we can do is we can estimate a Gaussian mean model. Yeah? So let's denote the return. Small r, rt, is the return of a strategy. It is the mean equation. Yeah? It is a function of, of an intercept term. It has an intercept term, obviously. Yeah? It has a sample average plus gamma times the uh, square sigma square t, which is the variance of that process at time t. So it's the conditional uh, variance. And because it's a regression equation, we have also an intercept, uh, a residual term, an error term t. So again, this is the mean equation This is the mean equation And then we have an equation for the variance as well So the variance Sigma square t, this guy here is a function where we have a del zero, yeah? we have also again an intercept term which is the unconditional variance, okay? And this is not dependent on, on time t, so we don't have a time index here, plus delta one times this, re this residual term squared time t minus one, so it's obviously a function of the squared residual of time t minus 1, which basically is the innovation part of that equation. And we have this variance lag. So we have delta 0, delta 1, plus delta 2, times the uh, times the sigma squared t minus 1. So the variance that we have also here in the mean equation is a function of a constant, which is the unconditional variance, yeah, irrespective of, 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 of time t, plus delta 1, yeah, some parameter, times the squared residual of time t minus 1 from the mean equation, plus delta 2 times the variance itself of, of time t minus 1. Then we have the third equation, yeah? so this guy here in the mean equation, our epsilon, which also turns out to be an increment, 
or a, var or a variable for the variance equation, yeah, that's the variance, that's the equation for the variance, and our uh, residual term, yeah, which also in left form enters the variance equation, is a function of the squared variance of time t, sigma square t times u t. Yeah? And u t, that's an innovation process. So that is our, that's, that's the standardized innovation process, basically. So that's the random part. Here we have the, the uh, random part. Let's just write random. So our UT are uh, in the standard gauge type model framework, our UTs are assumed to be normally distributed yeah? with, with zero. So UT, UT follows normally distribution with zero mean and the standard deviation of 1. Right? Because the standard deviation is 1, the variance is 1 as well. Okay? So the UT are somewhat normally distributed with mean 0 and standard deviation of 1. So that's the random part here. Yeah? The random component. So if you simulate the Gartsch model, obviously you start here. Okay? Because this is the random component. Yeah? You know the, how the normal distribution uh, looks like. Yeah? You have this uh, bell-shaped curve. Okay? And we know that there are some boundaries, so we have this uh, minus 1.96 and 1.96. Yeah? And we, have, we, well, we know that uh, everything that falls within these, these boundaries uh, have 95% probability. Yeah? And everything that is in above 1.96 or below minus 1.96, uh, then we have this 2.5% on the left and on the right uh, hand tile of that normal distribution. Okay, this is the standard assumption of a Gartian mean model. So, how do we test if the if our uh, risk factor or if, if our risk factor candidate fulfills these theoretically derived uh, conditions? Yeah. So it's obviously simple to assess if the mean is zero. So we have just we take just this risk factor candidate, yeah, our strategy, and check if the if the t-statistic indicates that the sample mean is significantly uh, positive. Okay? So we have to check if this sample mean has a t-statistic that is larger than 1.96. Okay? So then, how, do we, how can we test if the, uh, if the sample mean, or if, if, if the conditional, if the conditional uh, return, or excess return, the conditional excess return, is a function uh, of its variance, and given that it's a function of its variance, it should be and it should be fully explained by its variance. So obviously, what, what we have to do is we have to test. We have to test if the alpha, this guy here, is the alpha zero. So alpha zero question mark. Given that our exposure against the variance in the mean equation, our gamma, this guy here, this should be positive, right? It should have the same sign as our sample average of, the, of our risk factor candidate. So our risk factor candidate is obviously, by definition, positive, so this gamma should be positive. Is gamma larger than zero? Question mark. So these are the two uh, tests that we have to do given our gauge in uh, a mean model. Okay, we test if if the alpha is zero and if the gamma is larger than larger than zero. So the t statistics we have to check the t statistics of 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 this guy of these two guys in order to come to a conclusion. So given that these conditions are fulfilled, then we can conclude uh, that our risk factor or our risk factor candidate actually uh, satisfies the conditions to be a risk factor. So this is just one possibility, obviously, 
using the SCART Guard and Mean model or the SCART in yeah the SCART and Mean framework, the Guard framework, to uh, um, basically to to uh, de uh, derive the framework or to test the theoretical uh, implications that should be uh, fulfilled. Yeah, there are also other papers, and of course. You will always find uh, other papers that, that do it differently, and of course there are also a, there, there there is a paper that has a risk factor that derives some risk factor protocol. I think it is twelve con in this paper the authors derive sort of twelve conditions or something. Um, of course you can also use different frameworks. Yeah, so we we simply uh, used a, a very uh, straightforward framework. Yeah, that is basically de derived using Cochrane's law of one price yeah, uh, for, for asset markets. So this is basically how it looks like. Then again what you can do always is in the mean equation you can control for, for other risk factors. Yeah. So you can of course also here add um, the farm and French risk factors. Yeah. So uh, what you should do is always you should ensure that your model holds also, if you have uh, um, uh, small small changes, yeah. So you remember from the paper replicating anomalies that uh, you should basically perform a scientific replication of your of your own results in order to show that they actually hold. Yeah. So what we can do is see what we also did in our paper. We added some regressors here in the in the mean equation, so we controlled for the Farman French risk factors as well, the market factor, size factor. Uh, and, and the value factor as well. What we can also do is, of course, we can change slightly the model here. So we can basically, instead of the, of the variance, we could use simply the uh, volatility. Yeah?